Big skyscrapers, big roadways, big buildings. Life above ground is filled with all sorts of things built big. But what about below ground? Hi, I'm David McCauley, and I've spent a lot of time explaining how big things get built. I write and illustrate books, I host shows on PBS about building big things from pyramids and castles to bridges and tunnels. Today I'm standing in a spot that is very familiar to anyone who's visited the city of Providence. And right below my feet, they're working on one of the biggest building big projects you will never see. The Combined Sewer Overflow Tunnel Project's purpose is to greatly improve the health of Narragansett Bay and of the bay's tributary rivers. When completed, this tunnel will be 250 feet underground, 26 feet in diameter, and three miles long. This is no ordinary tunnel. It's being built under the direction of the Narragansett Bay Commission. You know, it's taken engineers thousands of years to perfect the art of tunnel building, to take advantage of space only available underground. So join me now and see why this Building Big project got started, how it's going, and best of all, what the benefits for you and me will be when it's finished. It's the biggest Building Big project you'll never see, at least from up here. Narragansett Bay is a resource which is known far and wide. Uh, people come from all over the country, and for that matter, all over the world, to enjoy uh, the resources that Narragansett Bay provides. And everyone should be concerned about the health of Narragansett Bay because it plays an important role uh, in, in their daily lives. And uh, while the Narragansett Bay Commission uh, is charged with the responsibility uh, primarily for a healthy bay and, uh, and keeping it healthy and maintaining the health of Narragansett Bay, people throughout this state uh, are going to benefit by the efforts of the Narragansett Bay Commission and its uh, executive director and staff because they are passionate about their mission uh, in keeping this bay uh, the, the beautiful resource that it is. When the Narragansett Bay Commission took over the Fields Point Wastewater Treatment Facility from the City of Providence in 1982, it was determined by EPA to be the second worst municipal pollution problem in New England. And in 1995, we were cited by EPA as having the best large secondary wastewater treatment facility in the country. So we made significant improvements in water quality to the urban rivers in Narragansett Bay by the improvements we made at Fields Point. However, we have a lot more to do. Uh, the combined sewer overflow problem, which has been here since the late 1800s, is being solved by our comprehensive combined sewer overflow program. This issue has been studied for a long time, and uh, the issue first surfaced with the Bay Commission uh, when I was governor, <coughs> and as to what to do to separate the storm drains and the sewage drains, and uh, uh, we knew then that it was going to be a, a very expensive project to do this. And, uh, and I know all the engineering studies and everything have pointed to the fact that this tunnel project is perhaps the best and the state-of-the-art way of, of uh, collecting all the rainwater until such time as it's treated properly. So uh, the project, you might say, is a little bit long overdue, uh, but uh, important for the health of the bay. When the sewer system was built in the late 1800s in Providence, Pawtucket, and Central Falls, only one pipe was installed in the streets and this pipe drained all of the homes and businesses wastewater and included storm drains from catch basins and roof leaders. And at that time, that was the state of the art. Uh, these pipes discharged to the local rivers without any treatment occurring at all. Uh, in 1901, the treatment plant was constructed at Fields Point and these pipes were tied in to the treatment facility. Uh, during a dry weather event when there was no rain, all of the flow from homes and businesses makes its way to the treatment facility. However, when it rains, depending upon the intensity of the storm, uh, the sewer system uh, capacity is exceeded and its combined sewer overflows or wastewater combined with rainwater or snow melt uh, relieves itself through the original overflow points and discharges to the urban rivers and ultimately Narragansett Bay. We lost so much grounds to pollution 
Um, we lost the Barrington River, 100 acre cove. We lost a lot of the, um, a lot of grounds to, to pollution. And basically I caught less clams. I burned more fuel, worked harder, caught less clams because the upper bay was close to shell fishing. And I'm talking 11,000 acres of upper bay. I'm not talking about a little bit, I'm talking about a lot. So it, it affected me personally in that the pollution drove me out of the industry. Well, right now we're in the permanently closed zone of, Nar of upper Narragansett Bay. This is all part of the Providence River. We're motoring south. When we get to Connecticut Point, we're going to enter what's known as Area A. And Area A closes on a half an inch of rain. And then beyond that, from, from Rumsick Point over to um, Colt State Park, there's a line that, that denotes Area B. Well, Area A is about 4,000 acres that closes on a half inch of rain. It closes for seven days because of the, the sewer out overflows that, that the CSO project is going to be addressing. It used to be the whole 11,000 acres closed on a half an inch, but because of improvements in the treatment plants and, and some of the things that the Narragansett Bay Commission has done to close off many of the CSOs, um, the, the, the bay was split into an area A that, that closed on a half an inch in an area B that closed on an inch. So the project was long debated over, for over a decade. It culminated in a process called the stakeholders process, which brought together some 32 interested parties. And of course, when you have 32 interested parties, you're probably going to have about 33 opinions on how, on how best to approach the project. There were 16 alternatives offered uh, out of the stakeholders process. We narrowed down to three, and then ultimately narrowed down to the tunnel option. We needed to involve other agencies with regard to how we were going to approach the project. And the Department of Transportation played a major role, as well as the, uh, the Department of Environmental Management. And I think bringing all of those interested parties together, as well as the uh, environmental community, uh, it was concluded that the best approach to dealing with this combined sewer overflow program would be the, uh, the tunnel option. When a rainstorm occurs, the sewer system exceeds its capacity and the combined sewers which currently discharge through existing overflows will be diverted once the tunnel is built into the tunnel for storage. The tunnel that will be constructed in phase one will be three miles long, approximately 300 feet below grade and 26 foot in diameter. Uh, the top end of the tunnel will start just west of the foundry complex in Providence. It will travel east. When it gets to the front lawn of the State House, it will take a 90 degree turn to the right, passing through the center of downtown Providence, along Eddy Street and Allen's Avenue to the Fields Point Wastewater Treatment Facility located in the Port of Providence. After the storm subsides, there will be a pumping station associated with the tunnel, which will pump the flow from the tunnel to the Fields Point Wastewater Treatment Facility, where it will receive adequate treatment and disinfection prior to being discharged to the Providence River in Narragansett Bay. Narragansett Bay Commission's combined sewer overflow project is by far the largest public works project ever commenced in the state of Rhode Island. Uh, when the project is complete, if all three phases are completed as intended, the project will, will approach $1 billion. Because combined sewer overflows are illegal under the Federal Clean Water Act, we have entered into a consent agreement with the Rhode Island Department of Environmental Management, putting us on a schedule to complete the entire project, all three phases. Uh, the first phase is seven years. We're about halfway through it right now. At the end of phase one, uh, we We'll start the preliminary design of phase two, but we will also be reevaluating if there are other technologies available which could accomplish what we want at a lower cost and less impact on the ratepayers. At the end of phase two, we will also take a time out and do a reevaluation of technology so that we ensure ourselves and our ratepayers that if there is a new technology out there to solve the problem, it's thoroughly evaluated before we proceed to the next phase. While we're catering to the recreational community, uh, we're doing business. 
whether it's in marine fisheries or whether it's uh, restaurants and beaches that provide recreational facilities for our, our state. Uh, the business community benefits from that attraction. And tourism is the number one industry in Rhode Island and will continue to be as long as we have a, a clean, healthy bay. It was a supreme effort, really. Uh, Mr. Shank, my boss, uh, Mike Shank, he, he designed the machine. He designed the machine and he built it. Um, some of which the machine was shipped. Uh, the main body, the TVM cutter head, and its shield, which is where we erect the segments, was shipped from Japan and arrived at the Port of Providence. Um, the total weight of just those three items approaching a million pounds. So it was a very difficult time to get it unloaded, especially when we had three feet of snow on the ground at the time to get it from the port to here. It was a monumental effort with our unions. Uh, you know, you've got Local 57, 271, some assistance from 88. You've got people from all over the country lending support to get this project accomplished. This is a 30-foot diameter tunnel, the TBM cuts that tunnel a full 30-foot diameter uh, almost continuously. It's, the TBM itself, uh, we use this cutter head, and this is the side of the cutter head that's facing the rock, and these little orange things are the disc cutters. To put that in perspective, each of these disc cutters is 17-inch diameter. The disc cutters at the front end of the TBM are rotating cutting heads which are thrust against the rock face by a ring of hydraulic rams located directly behind the cutter head. The disc cutters chip away at the rock and the TBM inches forward. The rams also steer the cutting head along the correct tunnel route from the control room where the driver can monitor the machine's movement. A laser guidance system keeps the TBM on course. As the cutter head moves forward, it dumps the ground up material called muck onto a conveyor belt where it travels to train cars that bring it up to the surface. The train brings materials into and out of the tunnel, including the pipes and wires that bring electricity and fresh air into the tunnel. The train acts as the lifeline for all of the underground operations, which may be up to three miles from the mouth of the tunnel. Life support systems, such as fresh air and electricity, must be constantly shifted forward as the tunnel extends. The goal of each support service is to keep the TBM progressing. Once the TBM is pushed four feet forward, concrete segments of tunnel lining, which are brought into the tunnel on the train, are put into place in four-piece sections to create finished support rings inside the tunnel. Each time a four-foot section of tunnel has been drilled, segment erectors pick up two pieces of the concrete segments from each side and put them into place to form the bottom of the ring. Each segment weighs more than 12,000 pounds. Next, the erectors swing two additional concrete segments into the top positions, completing the ring. The whole process then begins again. When complete, there will be 16,000 concrete rings lining the three-mile-long tunnel. 12 hours a day, uh, we're making good footage. Uh, we are averaging on our mining days versus our grout days, obviously, where we're stopped trying to repel water. Um, you know, 15 sets, 60 feet a day in 12 hours for a 30-foot machine is approaching world record pace when you're doing segments behind you. I mean, that's, we're doing very well. Uh, it was a difficult start, but we're doing well. Uh, I think as we look back on the process, uh, we can honestly say that everyone who had an interest in a healthy, cleaner, cleaner bay uh, had a voice in how we were going to deal with this issue. And it's one of the things that, that stands out in my mind. Uh, it was a proud moment because when you, when you can say that all the interested parties were truly represented and we've come up with a conclusion uh, that it's going to have the results that we expect to have, it's a defining moment 
in the Narragansett Bay Commission's history, and uh, one I think that I, as chairman, and the, and the commissioners are, are very proud of. It's a peculiar breed. We thrive on this work. It's competitive, uh, it's entertaining, in the sense that you're always busy and it's extremely dangerous. It's controlled chaos. You have to be heads up at all times uh, because there is danger there. Uh, but again, we find that sometimes, uh, oddly perhaps, fascinating. Well, what did you think? And imagine, this is all happening nearly 300 feet below ground. The Combined Sewer Overflow Tunnel Project is not only big in scope, but it's big in spirit, with the purpose of improving the health of Narragansett Bay and of the bay's tributary rivers. And best of all, this is one building big project that will not disrupt life in the state of Rhode Island. I'm David McCauley. Thanks for watching.